Hamatakiapi, Hape Chuzapi, Chanteoa Stay. It's quite an honor to be out here uh, sharing this stage and this platform with my beautiful sisters as well as our tribal dignitaries that came up to stand with Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier was incarcerated before I was born. There has not been a day on this earth that I've drawn breath that Leonard Peltier hasn't been free. And I think about that as a young indigenous man, but also somebody who looks to the past, especially the Red Power Movement and the things that it's done for our people and how that history and remembering that past sits in that jail cell in Coleman, Florida with one of our elders. And I think about back in 2016, when I left the Standing Rock camps here in North Dakota, I went almost immediately to Washington, DC because I knew the fight wasn't over, that Obama was leaving and that we had to advocate for one last push for Peltier's clemency. And it was a very difficult time for many reasons. But I think one of the most difficult things to remember is the impact that it's had on our people. His son, Leonard Peltier's son, passed away while we were in Washington, D.C. And he was the same age, he would have been 47 years old this year. He was the same age in, in years, the years that his father had spent in prison. And he died advocating for his freedom. How many more people have to die? How many more generations have to have their history taken from them and incarcerated? And we said it in 2016 that none of us are free as indigenous people if Leonard Peltier isn't free. And that the Standing Rock movement, the water protector movement that began at Standing Rock of course, we've all protected water for throughout history, but there's something special about that moment in time. And we're living in, this, in that moment in time. Like my sister said, these are prophetic times. Leonard Peltier was living in prophetic times. When the sleeping red giant awoke and brought this country to truth, to understand and confront its history of genocide against indigenous people, against the enslavement and the continued apartheid that our black relatives, brothers and sisters face. And like my sister said, this movement isn't just ours. Leonard Peltier didn't stop being an activist for his people once he was put on the inside. He continued to organize with prisoners of all races, getting them sober bringing them into the sweat lodge, connecting for the first time to their, spiritual, their spirituality as well as their ceremonies and culture. Because it's important to remember that the American Indian movement, whatever you may think, that movement began in prison. The founders of that movement, Eddie Benton Benet, Dennis Banks, Clyde Belcourt, began running sweat lodge ceremonies when they were locked up. And there's a lot that we can say about those figures, but we should judge them for the depths from which they've come and have risen, first and foremost. And the same goes for our brother, Leonard Peltier. And we know that he is in a COVID isolation unit right now as we speak, alone. He's not in a medical facility. He's not in a hospital. How many of you know somebody who has died of COVID-19? We all know somebody who's been affected by this pandemic and by this virus. And we know that those with pre-existing health conditions, those who are elderly, those who have poor nutrition are paying the heaviest toll. And think about the generations that we have lost not as just indigenous people, 
but this entire planet. In this country alone, over 900,000 people have died from this virus. Over 95% of those people were elders, completely erased. That, that is a huge toll. And we have to ask ourselves, when is enough enough? When are we going to allow people to continue suffering? And we can look at the facts of this case. We can remove, our, remove the emotion. We should be angry about it, but look, let's look at the facts first and foremost. The federal prosecutor who put Leonard Peltier behind bars, James Reynolds, came out during Obama's presidency pushing for clemency. And he's come out during Biden's presidency with the exact same arguments. And what he has said is he said that the evidence that was used to put Leonard Peltier behind, behind bars would not hold up in the court of law today. And it shouldn't have held up in the court of law in 1977. And he attributed the conviction of two consecutive life sent sentences of Leonard Peltier to the racist attitudes of people who comprised the jury in the court system here in this city, Fargo, North Dakota. His two co-defendants, Dino Butler and Bob Rubidoux, who were charged with the exact same crime, got off, or were found not guilty by reason of self-defense prior to Leonard Peltier's conviction. And it was because it was a different venue. And the federal prosecutors knew that. And they knew that they couldn't convict him based on the evidence, based on the theory that they did with his two co-defendants. And to this day, James Reynolds, the former federal prosecutor, did something that is rare for federal prosecutors. He said that not only should Leonard Peltier be granted clemency, but the focus should be on the conditions that were created in Pine Ridge at the time that led to his conviction, not by the American Indian Movement, but by the paramilitaries that were supported by the FBI that created a climate of terror. This is a federal prosecutor who's saying this. And so when we make these arguments about COVID release, that Leonard Peltier qualifies for COVID release, that's a DOJ argument. Department of Justice, William Barr, President Trump's former Attorney General made that argument. And in Coleman, nobody has qualified in, in Leonard Peltier's unit, prison unit, for COVID release. And so we know that it's not just his struggle. It's not just getting out Leonard Peltier, it's looking at why are prisoners, people who are incarcerated, being sacrificed to something that is completely preventable. They didn't get death sentences to be in there. The prison shouldn't be a death sentence. And then the second argument is that if there's a lack of evidence, and if this evidence was manufactured and created, and by all accounts, each side said that day in 1976 was a tragedy, excuse me, 1975, was a tragedy at the Jumbo property in Oglala. And we want to get to the answer. We want to get to the bottom of this. But why is it that one man is paying the price for something that was completely out of his hands? And why is it that there was no investigation of the young native man, Joseph Stuntz, who was also killed, most likely by law enforcement that day? Why is there no investigation? Where was the FBI with the 50 plus cases of AIM supporters and AIM members who died on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation following the Wounded Knee occupation? We can only conclude at the end of this that this continued incarceration of our elder, robbing us of this history of one of our relatives, is simply a cruel act of revenge. 
It's a punishment for indigenous people everywhere and our allies for saying that we should have clean drinking water. We should have dignity when we walk down the streets of, of Fargo, North Dakota. That these struggles are everybody's struggles. They're not just ours. It's not just an indigenous issue. If you went to Standing Rock, you saw there's non-native people who became water protectors. They stood with us, grounded in indigenous values. This isn't just an indigenous issue. This just isn't Leonard Peltier's issue. This is everybody's issue. This is an issue for the Department of Justice. And who can make the final decision on this issue? President Biden can make the final decision. We may not have gotten the promises to uphold treaty law in 2016 with the, the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the trespass through Ocheti Shakoi Treaty territory. We may not have gotten the Monomen protected in the precious rice beds of northern Minnesota in Anishinaabe territory, which are also protected under treaty law, but we can begin to reverse the course of justice, to begin addressing these things, and it begins with releasing Leonard Peltier from prison. And all we're asking, whether it's treaty rights, whether it's the release of Leonard Peltier, is for this country and this government to simply follow its own laws. That's the basic ask. That's not radical. That's where we're at, though, in this country, is to say that treaty law is the supreme law of the land, Article 6 of the Constitution, and that COVID protocols mandate that this man be released from prison. And they also mandate that he shouldn't be in prison, first and foremost, because of the things that he was convicted of. And so I just want to say thank you all for coming out from the bottom of my heart for putting your hearts and your spirits here today to stand with our relative Leonard Peltier. And it's important to remember that this is a long struggle. This, this is a long fight. He spent 47 years in prison as of today. But we have to say not one more day, not one more relative, and not one more life should be lost senselessly as revenge and punishment for indigenous people wanting to live dignified lives. Thank you.